Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The next illness that he mentions is hatred, which in Arabic is called bughas. And in Urdu, you would have the same word, hatred, spite, malice for somebody. Another disease, another means, another disease of the heart is hatred for other than the sake of Allah. It is, it's cured to pray for the one despised. This is with the understanding that you have not done wrong if you are repulsed by the hatred you harbor and do not act in accordance with it to harm the person. All right? Bukhuz means, right, to hate somebody for other than the sake of Allah. There's a very famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that you should love for the sake of Allah and you should hate for the sake of Allah. Hating for the sake of Allah means that to have a dislike in your heart or a bugs in your heart for the enemies of Allah, those who detract from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who malign Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who close off the path to us for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But other than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's asal, even for humanity, is that we should be compassionate towards all of humanity. And that's why in the Qur'an al-Kareem he addresses the believers and tells them that one of their attributes should be وَعَافِينَ عَنِ nas That they should be awful, they should be forgiving عَنِ nas Not just عَنِ mu'minin or عَنِ muslimin But they should be forgiving of all of humanity. So by and large, Bughaz is a very little scope for us to even have that Bughaz and the only extent to which we can have it and the place we can have it can only be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He immediately mentions his cure. The cure for bughas is to pray for the one that you despise. And many times in this day and age, right, bughas, hasad, these things are related to one another. And we have hatred for somebody. And you hate that person for the wrong reasons. Sometimes that hatred is born out of hasad. What does that mean? Is that you feel envy. You're upset that they have something. So first you are upset at the fact that they have something. This is what I did with you previously when we did bukha, right? And in fact, that is against the other towards Allah because you're actually upset with Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the being who gave them whatever it is that you're upset that they have. Second thing, sometimes the person starts getting bughas directly for that person. Starts feeling, it's like a fire in your heart. When you see, and the way you can tell it, when you see them, you see them on campus or you see them walking anywhere, your heart starts to get inflamed, you get upset, you feel agitated. You get in a bad mood, you wish you didn't see them, you wish they didn't exist. All of this is bogus, right? And if it's not done for the right reason, right, it's extremely wrong. And unfortunately, the reason this is being mentioned, unfortunately, you would think that this would be the last place bugs would occur. But unfortunately, there's a lot of bugs between fellow Muslims. Fellow Muslims of different groups or different views or different persuasions see one another and have bugs for one another. <laughs> Or even in Pakistan and some other places in the world with their own families that people have books for their own brother, sometimes sister, or daughter, or mother-in-law, Allah Akbar. Daughter-in-law and mother-in-law or daughter mother however you want to call it, have books. Hatred, deep hatred, malice, spite, very strong feelings against the other person. So it's cure being mentioned is that you have to pray. How can I rid myself of this book? So the first step is to be honest and realize what he says that you are repulsed by the hatred you harbor. The first thing is to feel that hatred and to be repulsed by it. We have to become morally offended, repulsed at our own behavior. We should look at that bugs inside of us and feel shame. First of all, be ashamed that, Ya Allah, what's wrong with me? That I have so much hatred for this person and it's not for some legitimate reason. And secondly, repulsion that we should be so upset with ourselves, that what type of person have we become? We become a hate-mongering person. This is the word that's used in English. You're a hate-mongering person. You harbor ill will towards other people. You harbor evil desires towards other people. So we should be repulsed at Yala, what type of person have I allowed myself to become? It's only when we feel that remorse and it's only that when we feel that repulsion that we would actually feel some desire to come out of it. The only person who is ever going to look for a cure is a person who honestly acknowledges themselves as sick. So especially in bogus, because the thing is that we rationalize, we justify our behavior. The no is justified hatred. They did this, this, and this. Or they think the X, Y, and Z. So and the first step is to get out of our delusion. Stop justifying and rationalizing the anger. Be, feel remorse. Feel that, feel that repulsion. And not to do any action in accordance to that hatred. Don't act on the basis of hatred. Don't make any decisions. You will find that all of these illnesses that we're going to do are going to be things that we should not base our decision on. 
You should not act or make a decision when angry. You should not act or make a decision when in a state of both. Because you will do something, you will try to hurt that person. You will try to harm that person. It might be physically, it might be verbally. You might try to malign that person. That is slander, ghibat, namima, backbiting. A whole series of things might happen to us if we fall into pre- fall prey to our books. The first thing is to control it, to swallow it. Second is to feel remorse and to be repulsed at it. And third, the final cure is to make du'a for that person. If we want to say that, how can we remove the bogus for this person in our heart? And you'll have to force yourself. It's not going to be, the du'a is not going to come to you naturally or lovingly. You have no love for this person. You're going to have to do taqallub jabran. You're going to have to force yourself to make du'a. And you have to make massive du'as for that person. Like as if they're your greatest friend or your greatest child or your greatest elder or your greatest teacher. Du'as for the akhirah and jannat al firdaus bighayr hisab and wilayat and taqwa and sunnat and happiness in this world and falaf al darain and success and joy in the both lives. Things that how you hate somebody, it may be very difficult to say that. But when you force yourself to say that with your tongue and your niyat is that you're doing this du'a, right, to cure yourself, then inshallah al-aziz, Allah Ta'ala will remove that bugs from your heart. The secret to all of these cures really is your own talab is in our own niyat. If we really want to be cured of a spiritual illness, then Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala is the one who's going to cure us. It's not ourselves, it's not the cure, it's not the book, it's not the dars. It's Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala who can cure us. All we have to do is put ourselves in range, right? All we have to do is turn the receiver on. All we have to do is become magnets of his rahmah, magnets of his tazkiyah. So the things mentioned here really are just things to make us those magnets. So when you start making du'a for that person in an attempt to remove your bogus, then Allah Ta'ala will remove your bogus. And He will accept your du'as also for that person <laughs> you may not want, but you will keep making them. Eventually then what happens is it's like you break down an ice wall and then eventually you will be able uh, to be happy and you will realize, especially if they're another Muslim, right, uh, that it's not uh, befitting a believer that they should have hatred or malice or spite for a fellow Muslim. The next element that he mentions is what in English this translator has chosen to mention is iniquity. Uh, in Arabic this is called baghawa, sometimes zulm. What it means is, is that you harm somebody. You wrongly harm somebody, you hurt somebody, you oppress somebody without any right to wrongfully harm someone. Okay? So the disease of inequity, iniquity is defined as harming a fellow creature. He's not even saying human being here. It can be an animal. Harming a fellow creature without right. Its cause is the powerfully intoxicating wine called the love of position. You have a particular status. You feel that Ab Dusranko Apni Nichi Rond Karsakti Ronna Ronna, right? Uh, the government servants understand what I'm saying. Ronna, right? To right suppress somebody underneath you, to use your power. And you'd be amazed. And actually one thing I really noticed in this country is that the poor people mess each other up. The level at which the poor people undercut each other. It's not permissible for anybody to undercut anyone. But the lack of compassion that some, and it's not in any way all or most or many, but some that I've witnessed, some poor people, the lack of compassion they have for one another, the way they undercut one another, the way the slightly less poor will undercut, right? The guy who's the foreman will come to you and be all surgy, 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 but when you leave him, the foreman, the way he ruins his labor underneath him, although the foreman himself is pretty much just one slight notch less poor. Then his labor underneath him, maybe he makes 9,000 and they make 6,000. It's not much of a difference, right? But even that difference, he feels it. And he lords it over them and he harms them and he oppresses them. So this is what he's saying is that the cause, what is the root of this illness? This love of position. So he says, remember if you wish to turn this intoxicant into useful vinegar. And this is a kanaya here, that from dates and from grapes you can make two things. One is you can make khamar which is wine, which is an intoxicant, which is a substance that is haram, which leads to bad attributes if it is consumed. And from that same grape you can make vinegar. And vinegar is something that is beneficial. In fact, in the hadith on Tib, the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned the faza'il and the benefits, the physical benefits of sirka, of vinegar. Right? And they can both be made from the same thing. So many times you find this theme. 
that you have one thing and from that, like a grape, you can make something that is good or you can make something that is evil, something that is beneficial or something that is harmful. So he's saying, how can you change this wine of intoxication of the love of position into useful vinegar? How many a leader achieved his heart's desire of rank and position, yet in the end the devotee and his object of devotion were leveled to equal planes by death? So the first thing he's mentioning is that number one is that in terms of mot, all of us are equal, all of us are going to die. And he's not just mentioning that to remind us of physical death. Mot here has the connotation of being returned to your Lord. And in that sense, all of us are going to be returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever zulm I do on this person, whatever harm I inflict on this person, I'm going to be called to account for that. And he will also be given audience by Allah to file his complaint against me. If no court in this world is willing to listen to his petition, if no malik, no boss is willing to listen to his claim against me in this world, there is a malik of the Yom Al-Qiyamah who is the master of that day, the master of all of us, who is going to give him a complete hearing, an audience, and then is going to call me to task. Right? So keep in mind that this desire is about turning away from your master towards his impoverished and miserly servants. Concern with the affections of others is exhausting, and though you may please some, others will flee from you filled with anger. Yet what is prohibited regarding the pleasure of others is what is procured by way of trickery, ostentatious display of religiosity, or hypocritical affectation. What is he mentioning here? He's mentioning this notion that sometimes a person will justify their uh, behavior that I'm doing something for the sake of making another person happy. Right? I'm doing this to the sake of pleasing somebody else. So what he says is again, concern with the affections of others is exhausting. If you run around in this world trying to please everyone and to do whatever makes other people please, that will exhaust you and that is tireless and you will never succeed even because you cannot please everyone. So though you may, though you may please some, others will flee from you filled with anger because when you try to please them and you don't, you're unsuccessful, then oh, they get angry with you. You don't meet their expectations, you don't fulfill the expectations that they had of you. Then he goes on to the formal legal ruling that what is prohibited regarding pleasing others is what is procured by way of trickery, right? So if you obtain something through some lie, some fraud, some deception, or ostentatious display of religiosity. Let me explain both. Trickery means that you get something of this world. This happens to a lot of people in Pakistan, justify bribery and corruption. Why? Because they're trying to please their parents or they're please their children or please their spouse. And so what they do is they earn money through at best doubtful or suspicious or tricking ways or sometimes through outright unlawful ways, right? But they justify this to themselves and you see when you justify something you won't feel remorse and you'll never make istighfar and you'll never do tawbah because you think it's perfectly fine. And they justify it to themselves in this way saying that well we have to do it to keep those around us pleased with us, those around us happy with us. The second way is ostentatious display of religiosity. These are those people who sell their deen for money, right? Who stand there waving a green turban and asking you to give them something just because they are religious, right? So we cannot, and that's the extent of their deen. They garb themselves in the outer trappings and the outer garments of the sunnah in order to earn financial gain from that sunnah. So this is also an improper way to gain money. Or another way to read this is that to please somebody, so the reason you right, uh, display religiosity is not to please someone, it's only to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot engage in any type of ibadah or any aspect of the deen to please another human being. That is a type of shirk in our niyat. Right? Everything that we do should have the most pure, the most sincere intention, which is that we're doing it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or hypocritical affectation. This, you know what this is, right? That, oh, two girls are doing humat of somebody, and then that girl comes, Ha, salikum, kya hale, atike. Oh, shabash. <laughs> just one second ago, let me just rewind the tape, 20 seconds ago, and what were you just saying about that girl? But hypocritical affectation, ye hota hai, mehran hota, hota hai. It's not just a girl saying, boy, it's men, right? Men who you know say all type of things about you behind your back when they meet you. They meet you as if Allah Akbar, as if they are your bosom buddy, and they are your best friend. It's a hypocritical affectation. Know that the seeker of their pleasure cannot expect the pleasure of Allah. If you seek the pleasure of makhluk exclusively, 
you will not be able to get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sooner or later there will be a contradiction. So what he's saying here in essence is if you prefer seeking the pleasure of makhluk, you will not get the pleasure of Allah, the fashioner of creation, the mighty, the capable, the khaliq, the azim. As for the one whose heart is encrusted with the love of this world, his only cure is having certainty of his mortality. So when we get caught up in love of this world, love of display, ostentation, the only cure for that is to realize that this world is not going to last forever. So this thing that you love is not going to be there forever. The example we normally give of this is if you stay in, I don't know, a hotel room, you can be a five-star hotel room, a wonderful hotel room, but because you know this is only going to last one night, you're not going to live in this hotel room forever. So you don't attach your heart to it. And you know with absolute certainty that tomorrow or the next day or maybe a week from now I'm going to check out. But your check out is such a certainty that even if you're there for a week or two weeks, because you're so sure you're going to check out, you never get attached to that room, to its walls, to its wallpaper, to its furniture, to anything. You just live in there, you just clock in, clock out, you just go there to sleep or to eat or whatever you do in the hotel room, right? And that is the way we should actually view this world. That this world is a place that all of us are guaranteed that we're going to check out from it. So his cure is then to have certainty of his mortality. Thus, if he keeps death constantly before his eyes, this acts as a cleanser for the soiled matter encrusting his heart. He's playing on a theme of hadith that the Prophet said. First, Allah SWT has mentioned this in the Quran al Karim about kufr, which is the ultimate sin. Bal lana ana qulubihim, that verily rust came onto their spiritual hearts. The Prophet has continued this theme in hadith that for the believers, that any time a believing Muslim commits a sin, a black spot comes on his heart. Such that as he continues to sin, he continues to having black spots come on his heart. Another day the Prophet also mentioned لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ سِقَالَةٌ That for each and everything there is a polish. وَسِقَالَةُ الْقُلُوبِ ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ And the polish for the spiritual hearts is the remembrance of Allah. So the polisher for this person, for this, is to remember death. To remember that this life is fleeting and therefore I should not be overly attached to it. Right? And this is true whether a person is an ordinary person, whether a person has a lot of power, rank, status, even when a person is a leader, right? And certainly the Sahaba Kiram, radiallahu anhu wa jama'in, the Khulafai Rashidin, and all of the other pious leaders that this Muslim Ummah has been able to witness, did not live a life as if their kursi or their position or their throne was going to last forever. They knew this whole world is going to come to an end. The next illness that he mentions is love of the world. This is a very famous thing the Prophet said in Hadith, حُبُّ الدُّنْيَ رَأْسُ كُلِّ That love for the world is the ras, is literally the source. Kulli khatiya of each and every wrong that a person does. So in the Hadith, and there's several Hadith that identify different things as the root cause, right? One root cause over and over mentioned in the Hadith and in the Qur'an al is love for this world. So what does he write in his poem? Realize also that blameworthy love of this world is what is solely for the benefit of the self. It does not include desiring it so that others are not burdened. In other words, it means others are not burdened by your needs. And so that you are secure from dependence on other people, nor does it include desiring it as provision for the next world. So we have to understand that there are several categories. And the same five categories that we have normally in legal rulings, that's required, obligatory, recommended, permissible, disliked, and prohibited. These same five categories are going to apply for love for the world. That love for the world, or really we wouldn't use the word love, but that seeking after the world that is mandatory is to earn a risk of halal and tayyib, which is sufficient for you and those who are dependent on you, such that you would not be dependent or burdensome on anyone else. That is obligatory, to the extent that anyone is able to do so. That which is recommended is that if a person has the ability to acquire more of this, run the certain conditions with which you have to work in the world, Obviously, there are certain things that you cannot do, such as interest and insurance. There are certain regulations that regulate the ability of a woman to work in this world, right? If she is able to uh, work in an environment, in a setting that is in accordance with the Sharia, then it's permitted for her to work as well, provided that her husband gives her, her permission, his permission. The second is recommended seeking of this world, and that is that you wish to acquire that of the world that is beyond this level of risk halal tayyib that you and your dependents need, but you do so for the sake of some good niyat. Maybe a person says that, okay, I want to be able to go on hajj and umrah regularly. A person says that I want to be able to give 
sadaqah for the, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to be able to support the poor. I want to build masajid. I want to build institutions of Islamic learning. They basically, their niyat in trying to acquire more of the world beyond their necessity, right, is good. It's for a sound purpose. And they want the thawab that comes from that. That's also perfectly fine. That look, there are many ways people earn thawab in this world. Somebody has a tibiyat, he's able to offer lots of nawaqal. Maybe my, I'm not able to do that, right? Some people say openly. Then would say, ye badate, shibadate, nehoti, itni zyada. Ab me kya karu, ab what I will do, I will earn money. And I will perhaps fund the people of ibadah, I will fund the place of ibadah, I will, that will be my ibadah that I will spend in sadaqah. Or a person says that Allah has given me this ability. I mean, alhamdulillah, I'm a rich person. Allah has given me this malaka, this ability in entrepreneurship or in business. So what I'll do is I'll keep running my business and the surplus money that I get beyond my need and necessity, I will donate that to various uh, different ways of doing khidmat of the deen. Right? Permissible. Permissible love of this world is, it is permissible technically speaking that a person wishes to acquire the world other than these two. Number one was necessity, risk of halal and tayyib. And the second one was for the sake of doing khidmat of the deen. A third way is a person says, well, you know, I just want a nice life. I'm going after the next job simply because I want to live more comfortably. I want to have a better car, maybe a bigger place or whatever it is, right? As long as they're not going into excess, which is israf, they're not doing it out of show, ostentation, display, riya, right? Then that is permissible for them. As long as the means through which they acquire the world are lawful and they not go through any type of excess. That which is disliked, Right? That which is disliked is to accumulate wealth. This is this word accumulation, right? which is one of the mantras of capitalism. Right? Accumulation for the sake of accumulation is disliked. And the more and more you accumulate it and the more and more you do it purely for the sake of accumulation, the more and more it becomes severely and prohibitively disliked. It moves up to a level of karahat al tahrim or becomes makruh tahrim Then a person just likes to have money just for the sake of it. They're not trying to show off. Nobody even knows. Right? They don't show it off to anybody. They live simply. They do fulfill their needs. They're not a burden on somebody else. They do give some amount for the service of the inner service of humanity. But at the same time, that inside, they still like to have it. And they still want it. They enjoy looking at their bank balance. 